Yeah. Uh, so we started off on day one with how to approach a neurology case. We started off by saying uh, that there is a central and a peripheral nervous system and that uh, every lesion has to be approached as a where, what, why pattern. So the where is the anatomy. The what, uh, the what is the type of lesion and the why is the etiology of the lesion. Then uh, we discussed a little bit of anatomy. Uh, what are the different types of the nervous system, the central and the peripheral nervous system? We discussed in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, can, can everyone mute their uh, audio, please? There is a lot of disturbance. Yeah, okay. So uh, we spoke about um, the different uh, steps in which uh, you examine uh, a neurological case. You see consciousness, high mental function, cranial nerves, motor, sensory, uh, reflex, coordination, and gait. Then uh, we talked about the importance of history taking. Uh, we talked about, uh, the next day we spoke about uh, stroke, uh, how to approach a case of stroke, uh, hemiparesis, how do you localize, whether you localize it to the uh, cortex, the internal capsule, or the brainstem, or the high cervical cord. We talked about the different uh, types of uh, symptoms and signs that the patient will come with if you have uh, all these different areas of lesion. We talked about uh, what can be the different types of uh, lesions that cause a stroke. Then we spoke about atherosclerotic plaques, cardioembolic stroke, and hemorrhage. We spoke about treatment of stroke uh, and how to investigate stroke. Then uh, yesterday uh, we spoke about uh, how to differentiate between an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron lesion. Uh, we spoke about, uh, again, we revised the anatomy and we uh, talked about what uh, will happen if there's a lesion above the lower motor neuron, that is anterior horn cell, and what will happen if it is a uh, lesion below the anterior horn cell, which is upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. We spoke about tone, spasticity, uh, re uh, brisk reflexes, weakness, and uh, we spoke about atrophy and fasciculations. Okay. And uh, again, we spoke about uh, how to localize this, uh, how to find out what is the lesion, and then finally, why is the lesion? That is the etiology of the lesion. Now, uh, today we will speak about quadriparesis. And uh, <coughs> uh, so today we will speak about quadriparesis. Uh, in uh, quadriparesis, what we are uh, basically talking about is that a patient will come to you with weakness of all four limbs. Now, uh, this can present in multiple ways, which is what today's lecture is going to be about. But uh, uh, just hang on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this can present in multiple ways. Uh, the weakness, uh, the weakness can present only on one side first and then move on to the other side. It can involve all four limbs at once. It could involve the proximal part of all four limbs and spare the distal part, or it could involve only the distal part and spare the proximal part. It could involve first only the lower limbs and then it could move on to the upper limbs. So these are the different variations in which ultimately weakness of all four limbs can present. So today's clinic is going to be all about how to approach a patient who comes to you and says, I can't move all my four limbs. Okay. Now, uh, again, the approach, like in every other case, the approach to this also will be where, what, and why. Okay, so step one. Yeah, okay. So uh, to carry on. So you, pre a patient presents with weakness of all four limbs. Uh, then uh, how do you, uh, how do you approach the case? So step one is to find out where is the lesion. And for that, you need to understand this basic structure that if, if there is weakness of all four limbs and if the face is spared, 
then that means that we are talking about a lesion that is below this level. So whatever it is, we are likely dealing with something that is below this level and this level is called as the high cervical cord. Okay. Now, uh, this is important because suppose there is a lesion that is also involving the mouth. So if the patient has dysphagia or dysarthria or if the patient has a facial deviation, then we are talking about a brainstem lesion and today we are not discussing a brainstem lesion. So we'll be discussing lesions that are high cervical cord or below. So there, every part of the neuroanatomy can come with quadriparesis. Now this is tricky to know, but uh, every part of the uh, neuroanatomy can present with quadriparesis. So uh, there is no part of the neuroanatomy that you can dismiss offhand uh, just because the patient has come with weakness of both sides. So uh, let's go from above below. So let's first start with the cervical cord and then keep moving below and figure out how each part of the neuroanatomy can present with weakness of all four sides. So the first step, so I've, uh, copied this uh, diagram and kept. Uh, it looks really complicated, so I'll be drawing a much simpler one later. But this is so that all of you can just see this is a cross section of the spinal cord. Okay, so uh, basically, in the spinal cord, I'll I'll just highlight the important ones. You need to remember that your posterior columns are obviously posterior. You have your pyramidal tracts, which is your lateral pyramidal tract, which is important. And you have your lateral spinothalamic tract. Okay. Wait, I'll just uh, use a different color for this. Yeah. All right. So these are the three things that you need to remember. So you need to remember uh, the posterior one, you need to remember the lateral spinothalamic one and you need to remember the pyramidal tract. So if you, if we draw this again, now we discussed this last time that in a spinal cord, the gray area is inside and the white, the gray matter is inside and the white matter is outside. So you have all these three things that we discussed, these one, two, and three, all these three things are white matter tracts. So naturally they will be outside the gray matter. So the posterior column is this, the lateral spinothalamic tract is this, and the pyramidal tract is this, also known as the corticospinal tract. All right. Now, these are the three things that you have to remember. And these three things are sufficient for you to uh, diagnose the case. If it is a cervical cord lesion. Now, why is this important? If a patient comes to you and let's just see what these three things do. What does the pyramidal tract do? It controls your motor movement. So if this is gone, you have weakness. Mm. I'm sorry, uh, somebody has left their uh, audio open and there's a lot of sound that's coming through. Mm. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Thanks, uh, whoever that was, thanks. All right, can you all hear me now? Yeah. So uh, your pyramidal tract controls your motor movement. So if your pyramidal tract is gone, there is weakness. Your lateral spinothalamic tract controls your sensations of pain 
and temperature and your posterior column controls your sensation of pressure and vibration and joint position sense okay so if you remember if you can just remember these three things pain and temperature pressure vibration joint position and motor movement we can use these three things to localize which of these three tracts are involved so if a patient comes to you with only weakness only motor weakness and his sensations are absolutely fine there is no sensory problem then the problem lies only in the corticospinal thalamic tract if a patient comes to you with weakness and sensory loss then you have to figure out which sensory loss is it pain and temperature or is it pressure and joint position suppose it is pain and temperature then that would mean that only your pyramidal tract and your lateral spinothalamic tract is involved which means that the lesion is in this part which means that your uh, posterior part of your spinal cord is spared and supposing if the patient comes with a lesion of all the three then there will be weakness sensory loss of pain and temperature and joint position sense so all three things will be lost in all four limbs so you get the idea of why uh, both history and examination is directed towards this thing the history is directed towards do you have weakness of all four limbs do you have sensory loss of all four limbs and if yes is the sensory loss on pain and temperature or is the sensory loss towards joint position sense now the questions that you have to ask for this are very specific so and they are important so i'll just ask you motor pain and temperature and joint position sense motor the question that you have to ask is obvious can you move so if there is no movement then that means there is weakness or if there is less movement then that means there is weakness pain and temperature is unnoticed injury so if the patient is unable to feel temperature he may lift he may lift up a hot cup of chai and not realize that his fingers are getting burnt or he may walk and stub his toe somewhere and he may not even realize that he has stubbed this toe and he will suddenly look down and realize that he's bleeding so these are uh, characteristic signs of loss of pain and temperature joint position sense you ask about swaying or ataxia and there is something called as wash basin ataxia so what this essentially means is that romberg is positive now without complicating it too much what this means is that if the patient is standing and his eyes are open he can use his visual cues to realize that he is standing upright and so he can maintain his balance but if his eyes are closed then he will lose his balance because his joint position sense is gone so it is there in the word itself you can sense the position of your joints so your posterior tract your the the dorsal column is responsible for sensing the position in which all your joints are there so your spine your hip your knee your ankle your toes these are all joints and are, are these joints flexed extended by how much are they flexed extended this sense is given to your brain through the posterior column so if this is gone and if your eyes are closed then that means you have no help so then you will suddenly lose your balance so what wash basin ataxia means is that in the morning when the patient suddenly closes his eyes on washing his face he will have a sudden attack of giddiness or imbalance so that is called wash basin ataxia now this is roughly the three questions that you ask to uh, during history to localize whether your motor system is involved your lateral sensory system is involved and your dorsal sensory system is involved and if suppose all three are involved in all four limbs then you localize the lesion to a cervical cord that means that the lesion is somewhere higher
okay now suppose the these three problems are there in only two limbs so only on the right side you have all three problems and on the left side it is completely normal now this could mean that it is a hemiparesis or it could mean it is a quadriparesis in evolution so if you wait for another week you will get this problem here also now if that is the case then that means that there is a cervical cord problem but it is gradually developing so that means that there is probably some form of lesion that is pressing into the cervical cord slowly okay now that is what we'll be discussing next this is called as myelopathy so myelopathy is any pathology of the spine and this could be a compressive or a non compressive lesion okay so uh, what is the what is the concept basically let's draw this again you have your spinal cord and uh, sorry okay and uh, this is your gray matter and outside is your white matter so there is a dural covering for your spinal cord just same as the brain so uh, you know about the three meninges there is the dura mater the arachnoid and the pia mater so the dural mater is the one that is uh, outside so um, <clears throat> uh, the dura mater covers the spinal cord and it is a protective layer now suppose there is a lesion on the outside okay now this could be anything so this could be say a metastasis or it could be an abscess whatever it is it doesn't matter suppose there is a x lesion now this lesion is slowly growing and it is compressing the spinal cord from the outside so we you already remember that there are three things to uh, see there is a lateral spinal thalamic tract there is the posterior column and there is the pyramidal so the pyramidal tract is there in both sides cortico spinal thalamic tract so as the lesion enters into the spinal cord and there is pressure from the outside these three these three fibers start getting compressed now which one of these three things will start getting will get compressed first and which one will get compressed later that depends on the uh, location and the type of this lesion so it's different for different lesions but roughly your pyramidal tract and your lateral spinal thalamic tract are involved more and your posterior columns are involved less because they are more protected behind unless there is a posterior compression in which case a posterior column will get involved first so if there is a compression here slowly slowly these two things get start getting compressed Uh, okay, so there's a one, one plus one plus three. Can you uh, mute your uh, phone, please? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, what this would clinically present as is the same lesion is over here, okay, and it is pressing into the spinal cord just like we are showing here. So gradually there will be a motor weakness of the right if this is a cervical cord there will initially be a motor weakness of the upper limb followed by there may be a sensory weakness sensory uh, sensory loss of the upper limb and then there will be a motor weakness of the lower limb and there will be a sensory weakness sensory uh, loss of the lower limb of the same side so if this is coming from the right side then the right upper limb and right lower limb will get involved 
Now, why is the upper limb involved first and the lower limb involved second? Because in the spine, so if this is the brain and this is the spine, the fibers are coming down and the fibers are exiting. So if there is a lesion in the cervical cord, the lesion might first compress the exiting roots and then it will compress the cord and then it will compress the fibers that are going down below and exiting. So the chances of the same level being involved first are more and then your lower limbs will get affected. Now suppose that pressure doesn't stop. Suppose the pressure goes on increasing and the cord is getting compressed up till here. What happens is that you have to remember that the spinal cord is not a thick metal, metal like thing. So it is quite soft and uh, smushy. So what will happen is that your opposite side cord. So the pyramidal tract on the opposite side and your lateral spinal thalamic tract on the opposite side will start getting compressed against the bone and the dura matter here. So eventually, after your right-sided corticospinal tract and lateral spinothalamic tract get compressed, your left pyramidal and spinothalamic tract start getting compressed. And so you will start getting weakness of your right lower limb followed by your, sorry, your left lower limb followed by your left upper limb. So you have right upper limb first, right lower limb second, left lower limb third and left upper limb fourth. So this is called as a U-shaped weakness. And this is also called as Ellsberg phenomenon. Okay. So um, this is specifically seen if there is a lesion that is uh, now i have shown this as a lesion coming from the outside but usually this ellsberg phenomenon is classically seen if there is a lesion inside the dura so inside the dura but outside the cord which is called extra medullary okay <clears throat> now this is not uh, this is not a um, a hundred percent rule. It that it is very subjective. There can be a lesion which is inside the cord substance that can also cause this phenomenon, or there could be a lesion outside the dura that could cause this phenomenon. But overall, this lesion is caused by something in between the dura and the cord. Now we'll just talk about this in one line. So if this is the cord and this, this is the cord and this is the dura. The substance of the cord is called the medulla of the cord. So you have, you can have intramedullary lesions. You can have extramedullary lesions. And the extramedullary can be either extra dural or intra dural so depending on whether it is outside or inside the dura it is extra dural or intra dural and depending on whether it is inside or outside the medulla of the cord it is intra medullary extra medullary okay so uh, that is uh, that one brief line about what is the difference between uh, intra medullary and extramedullary an intramedullary lesion will rise from somewhere here or here or here so these are usually tumors such as uh, ependymoma or an astrocytoma or it could be a neurofibroma or it could be an av malformation Clinically, what will happen is that depending on the site of the lesion, it will start compressing the tracts which are nearest to it. So there is no classical uh, pattern in which this thing can progress, but there are certain tracts such as your uh, 
bladder your bladder uh, fibers now these may start getting compressed much earlier so in an intramedullary lesion your bladder involvement is early okay now pain pain is very important and the characteristic of pain is quite different in an intramedullary and extramedullary lesion an extramedullary that is an extra dural lesion will compress the roots first okay so compression of roots will cause a radicular pain whereas an intramedullary lesion will lead to something called as funicular pain so the difference is that a radicular pain is sharp shooting and a funicular pain is diffuse vague and widespread okay we won't get in, into the details of why a funicular pain and radicular pain are different and the anatomy of it we can discuss pain as a separate topic sometime but uh, this is roughly the difference and again uh, your elsberg phenomenon is more common in your extramedullary lesion uh, all right so that is uh, that is that so, so your high cervical cord lesions we have covered now this is uh so if a patient comes with all four limb involvement uh and if there is motor and sensory involvement then we can think about a high cervical cord and most important is that in high cervical cord it is usually a, a umn lesion so except for the fibers that are getting affected at that level where it will be an lmn lesion because your lower motor neuron is involved at that level below that everywhere it will be a umn lesion okay is that clear do you need me to uh, explain this point more or, or does that does that make sense to everyone or so you can use the chat to uh, respond okay oh great uh, so yeah so this is very very important because uh, your umn findings the umn findings such as your just to revise spasticity uh increase reflexes uh weakness but less than your lmn and uh, there's no atrophy no fasciculations so these are your umn findings and uh, these are the findings that you will get in a high cervical cord lesion let's move a little below and talk about what if the lesion is not in the spinal cord so this is your cervical spinal cord this is your dorsal your lumbar and your sacral okay now for all four limbs to be affected the lesion has to be in the cervical cord obviously because if the lesion is in the dorsal or below your hands will be spared only your lower trunk and your uh, legs will be involved so we, since we are discussing quadriparesis we will be talking if all four limbs have weakness then how do you approach it so that means that the if it is a spinal cord lesion it should be either in the uh, in the cervical cord or it can be in the brain stem it can be in the cortex as well but it would be a very large lesion and uh, there will be other things that are involved such as your uh, sensorium your cranial nerves your dysphagia dysarthria all those things will be involved it would not be purely just your four limbs so we are discussing a uh, purely four limb involvement so if it is not your cervical cord then where can the lesion be you just leave the cervical cord and you come out so you have your roots you have your plexus the plexus will lead to a nerve the nerve will end in a nerve terminal and you have your muscle and you have a neuromuscular junction that is connecting the nerve and the muscle so all of these things can present as 
quadrupeds. And it could be a root lesion, it could be a plexus lesion, it could be a nerve lesion, a neuromuscular junction lesion, and a muscle lesion. All these three, or all these are different sites, neuroanatomical sites can lead to quadriparasis. Uh, that is weakness of all four limbs. So uh, what will be the difference? Why am I taking all these things separately and your cervical cord separately? Because all these uh, lesions will be lower motor neuron lesions. Okay, so in your lower motor neuron lesions, you will find the things that we discussed yesterday. Hypotonia, weakness will be much more, a reflexia, atrophy, and fasciculation. Yeah, so you get a patient with weakness of all four limbs. You take history, you figure out whether there is only weakness or is there sensory loss. Uh, we, we'll talk about history taking a little uh, in two minutes, but uh, we, roughly you just find out if what all are the uh, complaints. Is it only weakness or is it motor plus uh, sensory? And in your history and in your examination, our main focus should be, is it a UMN, purely UMN or is it LMN? Now, if it is a UMN, and if there is all four limbs involvement and there is no facial involvement, no cortical involvement, then your uh, diagnosis is automatically a high cervical cord lesion. Suppose it is a LMN lesion, then it is difficult to say. You can only say that it is not a cervical cord lesion, but it could be any of these uh, five, uh, five uh, lesions. Now, how do we approach uh, these things? So, if in an M at an MBBS level, uh, let's let's just be pragmatic. At an MBBS level, to diagnose that it is a UMN cause of quadriparesis or an LMN cause of quadriparesis is good. You need to know a little bit more about what are the characteristics of these five things. At an MD or DM level, obviously, you need to go much deeper. So we'll talk about uh, these five a little more: roots, plexus nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscle. Okay, so all of them will be LMN. So that goes without saying, but what are the classical findings in each one? So one or two lines about each one I'll just give you. Uh, alongside all the LMN findings, in root you will get radicular pain. One. It is generally uh, localized. There can be generalized radiculopathy, but uh, usually it is a compressive lesion. So a root cause of quadriparesis is actually quite rare unless it is associated with nerve. So a nerve pathology is called a neuropathy and a root pathology is called a radiculopathy. So an isolated radiculopathy causing quadriparesis is very, very rare. So what you will have is a polyneuroradiculopathy. So nerves involved and alongside the nerves, you have the start of the nerve, which is the root. So if you get a combination of this, then your roots would also be involved and your nerves will be involved. So there will be signs of radiculopathy plus there will be signs of neuropathy. So the commonest cause of this is GBS or CIDP, which is a chronic form of GBS. I won't be discussing GBS in detail. We can discuss that uh, when we do uh, neuropathies. Now, a uh, plexus, again, a plexus causing a quadriparesis is rare. It is uh, usually a single plexus is involved and it is, again, usually traumatic. And the second cause is inflammatory. Okay, so a plexus, there are mainly two types of plexus. There is your brachial plexus and your lumbosacral plexus. Your uh, brachial plexus, so your brachial plexus is the plexus that controls movement of your arms and your lumbosacral plexus controls movement of your uh, legs. 
So these are the two types of flexors. Usually uh, one side is involved and usually only the upper limb or the lower limb is involved. There can be a generalized flexopathy in um, uh, autoimmune diseases or uh, a paraneoplastic, but rare. So definitely it should not be in your uh, top differential. Flexopathy uh, doesn't usually come with pain. Flexopathy comes with uh, just element signs, that is weakness, atrophy, and uh, fasciculation. Now we come to nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscle. Now these are the main causes of quadriparesis, LMN quadriparesis. Okay, so what is the difference? So nerve, NMJ, and muscle. So the main difference is that nerve is usually, uh, there is sensory involvement also. Whereas neuromuscular junction and muscle are pure motor, logically, because a muscle involvement will not cause any sensory loss and a neuromuscular junction involvement will not cause any sensory loss. So if you have a patient with quadriparesis and there is zero sensory involvement, then neuromuscular junction and muscle should be higher up in your differential diagnosis. If there is sensory plus motor, then you can have either a nerve or it could be a spinal cord. And you differentiate that whether it is an LMN or a UMN. So uh, in coming to nerve, one is sensory involvement. Second is that it will follow a nerve distribution. So for that, you need to know uh, which are the nerves. So in your upper limb, uh, your three main nerves are ulnar, median and radial. That is your peripheral nerves. And uh, in your lower limbs, you have your sciatic and your femoral and you have your tbl and common peroneal now uh, you don't have to go too much into detail but uh, a brief knowledge of which nerve uh, distributes which area and supplies which area will help you figure out whether it is a neuropathy because if there is an ulnar nerve ulnar neuropathy then only the ulnar area will get involved Whereas if there's an ulnar, median and radial, then all three will get involved. The third thing is that a neuropathy is usually a distal weakness. Whereas a muscle is usually a proximal weakness. Uh, so a nerve causing distal weakness is because what we discussed yesterday, because your, uh, your distal nerves require uh, are at most danger of damage because they don't get enough nutrition and uh, any problem in the nerve will cause a distal damage first before it causes a proximal damage uh, other than this uh, your other features will be the same both of them will have element features your uh, muscle your uh, muscle problems can lead to myalgia Whereas a nerve problem can lead to neuropathic pain. So both of them can have pain, but the characteristic of the pain is different. Myalgia is different and neuropathic pain is different. Uh, okay, so that, that is uh, briefly what uh, you have to look for when you get a patient of quadriparesis. Uh, and how do you localize it from cervical cord, which is UMN, versus element, which is all of this. And in these three things, your nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscle are the important differential diagnosis. Now, uh, that completes uh, where is the lesion, okay? Now, to talk about uh, what is the lesion, <clears throat> it, like in all other cases, the what completely depends on the where. So if it is a cervical cord lesion, it is a myelopathy. And the cause of myelopathy is compressive and non-compressive. If it is a, a nerve lesion, it is a neuropathy. And the causes of neuropathy is uh, varied. And it could be uh, something like diabetes mellitus or it could be an autoimmune. And a muscle is a myopathy. And in all of this, it could be a congenital neuropathy, a congenital myopathy, or an acquired myopathy, or an acquired neuropathy. 
I'm not going too much into detail in this because I hope to do one class each on uh, neuropathy and uh, myopathy. So hopefully that will uh, clear up the, we'll go into a little bit more detail there. And uh, so what is the lesion and why is the lesion are very closely interlinked. So uh, because what and why, so supposing it is a compressive lesion, then you, you have to evaluate to see whether it, is it, why is the lesion, is it a cancer? Is it an infection? If it's an infection, what infection? Is it TB? And similarly in neuropathy, if it is an acquired autoimmune, then what autoimmune? Is it GBS? Is it CIDP? Is it associated with SLE? Now these are all different uh, diagnosis, uh, etiologies of diagnosis that you can evaluate once you figure out where is the lesion and what is the lesion. And uh, evaluation completely depends on your localization. So if it is a cervical cord, you go for an MRI cervical spine. If it is a, uh, if it is a nerve, you will go for a nerve conduction test. If it's myopathy, you will go for an electromyography. And uh, that is how you approach it. And uh, treatment completely depends on, uh, again, where is the lesion. So uh, if it is a cervical cord, you will go for either surgery or you will start treating the infection, you will give a collar because it is very important to uh, stabilize the cervical cord. Uh, and if it is a nerve or a muscle disease, then you will have to treat the etiology. So that we can talk about a little more detail in the nerve and muscle class. And uh, I think that covers it. So what have I not covered? I have not covered details of bladder involvement because that is a whole other lecture if I have to do it. Uh, only thing you have to remember at this stage is that an intramedullary lesion can cause bladder involvement first, early, and an extramedullary will cause it late. Um, I have not covered uh, brainstem causes of uh, quadriparesis, but uh, like I said, brainstem causes will cause some form of cranial nerve involvement. So you can differentiate that. I have not covered syrinx. So a syrinx is uh, when your central canal inside the spinal cord becomes large because of some reason and it causes compression from within the cervical cord, within the spinal cord. So uh, it acts as an intramedullary lesion. So again, bl early bladder involvement, funicular pain uh, and all those things. Um, I have not covered, I have not covered. So in syrinx, you um, have something called dissociative anesthesia. Dissociative sensory loss, which basically means that your uh, joint position sense is normal and your pain and temperature is gone. Uh, the reason for that is that your pain and temperature fibers will uh, cross in the center like this. And your uh, joint position sense fibers are safely behind and they don't cross anywhere. So the compression reaches uh, till your spinal cord quite, uh, your posterior column quite late. But uh, your uh, crossing fibers of your pain and temperature are at much greater risk of early compression. So initially your pain and temperature will go in the hands and your joint position will be normal. So the patient will just come with repeated. Uh, injuries to the hand so there will be hand injuries because he won't realize that uh, he's not able to feel temperature so he may put his hand into scalding hot water and uh, but he will not feel that there's anything wrong with his hand because he's able to sense it quite properly his joint position sense is normal so that is called dissociative sensory loss and uh, yeah, I think that that does that covers the uh, subject. I've taken okay, so this one took much longer than I expected. It's forty five minutes, <clears throat> but um, yeah, that covers the topic. Now, if there is any questions, then can you ask in the chat room so we can discuss it? Uh, okay, fine. Okay, thanks, fine. I'm glad you liked it. 
So Faima is a, a hematologist from uh, Edutias. She was one of my juniors. Nice to see that other specialties are also attending. I hope this is useful. Um, I'm sure it will be useful. I'm sure you get cases where there are uh, there is a neurological uh, component, so it will be useful for you. Uh, so, Doctor uh, Doctor Prana was just asked how to differentiate between neuromuscular junction and myopathy. So that's a good question. Um, Okay, so let's just uh, take that separately. Uh, okay, so you have neuromuscular junction and you have muscle. So uh, the basic concept of neuromuscular junction is that, uh, okay, suppose this is your muscle, no, muscle fibers is not like this. So this is your muscle fiber. So your muscle fiber is like this. And uh, you have a nerve terminal, okay? So this is your nerve. And you have acetylcholine, and your acetylcholine gets released, and then your uh, muscle fiber gets into excitation. And your whole problem with your uh, neuromuscular junction is that uh, your something is wrong with your acetylcholine release or action. So ultimately, your acetylcholine is not acting on your muscle, and so uh, your excitation does not happen, which leads to weakness. So that is the primary concept of neuromuscular junction disorder and uh, so the main thing is uh, the main difference is that uh, your neuromuscular junction and when we say neuromuscular junction we are basically talking of myasthenia there are other types but your main uh, differential is myasthenia gravis so the important thing in myasthenia gravis is that it is a, again pure motor element it is fatigable. Fatigable meaning that uh, you will initially start uh, walking or exercising, and you have acetyl you have some acetylcholine which is acting, but then suddenly, uh, as you go on working, your acetylcholine disappears or it ru you run out of acetylcholine, and so your uh, muscle starts getting weaker and weaker as you uh, keep exercising. So you have fatigable weakness. There is diurnal variation. So by diurnal variation, you mean uh, it's um, in the day you are better and by evening your symptoms increase. And uh, usually in a neuromuscular junction, your eyes are involved. So you get ptosis and you have uh, diplopia, right? And you can have uh, respiratory uh, involvement. So you can have uh, dyspnea. So uh, these are the uh, features that are more common in a neuromuscular junction uh, disorder. Now, in a myopathy, uh, what are the similarities between these two? Uh, both of them are uh, pure motor uh, element. Both of them can cause proximal muscle weakness. But uh, in a myopathy, uh, you will, it's not, fatigable. Now see, there are exceptions to everything, but uh, usually it is not fatigable. And uh, ptosis is um, not very common in uh, myopathy, but uh, of course there are some myopathies that can come with ptosis, but uh, it's not very common and uh, there is no diurnal variation. So if you have myopathy, you have myopathy. It doesn't, uh, it won't really uh, change with uh, day and night. There are myopathies that are fatigable. There are myopathies that worsen with exercise. There are myopathies that improve with exercise. There are some channelopathies, but we are not getting into that. Uh, roughly, this is the difference. And, but even so, even so, if you have a proximal muscle weakness, you you will keep a neuromuscular junction and a myopathy uh, as your differential and you will go on to investigation. So between these two things, you have to investigate because in a myopathy, your CPK will increase and its creatinine phosphokinase will increase and your electromyography will tell you because an electromyography in a myasthenia gravis should be normal and a RNST. So your that is your uh, repeated nerve, stimulation test 
doesn't matter what it is, but this is positive in a myasthenia gravis patient. So you have to uh, evaluate and you have to, the important thing is to keep the differential in mind and then uh, go on to um, evaluate for both. So uh, myopathy people may think of, but neuromuscular junction people will not remember. So it is important to remember neuromuscular junction, especially because it is treatable and uh, even more because if you don't treat it, it is life-threatening. So uh, yeah, you have to remember that. Any other questions? How would you differentiate a progressing neuropathy with no history of DM? Uh, uh, sorry, what? A progressing neuropathy, no history of diabetes, singling numbness, altered sensation, uh, slow development, period of few months, assuming cervical spondylosis has been ruled out. Okay, so that's a case of neuropathy then. Uh, so if it's a case of neuropathy, uh, we have to evaluate it as a uh, neuropathy. So evaluation of any symptom, again, once we have uh, diagnosed the where, which in this case, you seem to have diagnosed it as a neuropathy, then you have to find out what. And in the what comes the ODP. So you have to find out onset, how quickly it developed, is it acute, is it chronic, uh, duration, is it a static, uh, did it progress suddenly, and uh, how, how long has it been, and uh, progression will mean static, or is it, uh, is it stepwise, is it, did it increase and then decrease again, and then increase again, uh, that is, it, is it recurrent, is it episodic, so the, this will uh, give us an idea of what is the etiology of neuropathy. So if diabetes has been ruled out, then, uh, and if it is a slowly progressive thing, then we can think of uh, uh, CIDP, or you can think of other, uh, there are lots of causes basically, if it's associated with multiple myeloma, or if it's a poem syndrome, CIDP should be ruled out. Even before that, a nerve conduction test should be done, uh, because that will give us a much better idea. Is it axonal demyelinating? We'll discuss this case uh, when we discuss neuropathies. Is that okay? We could, then we'll just get uh, caught up in neuropathy. Cool. Any Anything else? Four, five, six, seven. So um, just... I mean, this is actually a good thing uh, you told me. Uh, a quick uh, talk of uh, what, how will ODP uh, matter? So, in each of these lesions, an acute. So, if you take a, if you take just onset, if it is an acute onset versus if it is a chronic on chronic onset, then uh, that would uh, change everything. So, uh, it would um, an acute. Cervical myelopathy uh, would mean a myelitis, a transverse myelitis, whereas a chronic uh, cervical myelopathy could uh, uh, mean more of a compressive lesion. Uh, an acute neuropathy would mean it is a, it's like a GPS or an inflammatory cause, whereas a chronic neuropathy could be, say, a lead poisoning or it could be diabetes. And uh, similarly, an acute myopathy could mean it is a toxin, it is uh, statin-induced, or it is some viral myopathy. And uh, a chronic myopathy could be, uh, you know, it could be like a hereditary myopathy. So that it is really important to do ODP in the when you are evaluating the what. So the when in the in the where ODP uh, is less important, but in the what. Uh, ODP is the most important uh, thing to remember. Okay. Uh, all right. Anything else? Now, uh, one very important thing that I didn't talk about because I thought it might just uh, complicate things is that between your cervical cord, that is UMN, and the LMN, there is a lesion involving your anterior horn cell okay so your anterior horn cell can also cause quadriparesis and this could be i kept this to the last because this could be either purely lmn 
that is only your anterior horn cells are involved which is seen in things like polio or west nile virus or it could be umn plus lmn which is seen in motor neuron disease okay so uh, your motor neuron disease affects not only your anterior horn cell but it also affects your pyramidal tract that goes up and it also affects your upper motor neurons so that is why there is both umn findings and uh, lmn findings so uh, your motor neuron disease is very um, unique in that sense that you may get both lmn plus umn and in fact if you find both lmn and umn signs in the same limb then uh, you are thinking of motor neuron disease directly like your, it makes your diagnosis very easy <clears throat> okay so that that I, i think that covers it uh tomorrow tomorrow we will uh, talk about uh, paraparesis so your upper limbs are normal and only your uh, lower limbs are involved so how do we approach a case of paraparesis cool uh okay i think i think we are sorted uh no all clear all right awesome all right see you guys have a safe quarantine take care keep washing your hands bye bye